welcome back to Big Questions. I'm Dr. Suzanne Rivera. A curious trend has appeared since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. More and more people have been participating in rituals. These have been rituals of all sorts, from religious traditions to spiritual practices to the purely secular, like taking a daily walk. This interest in grounding rituals has emerged despite a steady decline in the U.S. and the importance of structured religion in Americans' everyday lives. So why are people participating in more rituals now? And what does this tell us about the role rituals can play during uncertain times? Here to help answer these big questions is Reverend Kelly Stone, McAllister's chaplain. Reverend Stone, thanks for being with us today. It's a pleasure. So let's jump right in. You specialize in fostering human interconnection. How is this work unfolding in the midst of a global pandemic? It's a great question. And as you noted, we are watching trends across the United States of religiosity going down. Some interpret that data as lack of interest in religion. Um, I interpret it as an opportunity to foster new ways of doing meaning making and interconnected work and, and building community. The decline of religious identity, one of the things that has happened, um, especially amongst our emerging adults, is there's a loss of shared language. And so ritual is, in some ways, swooping in and taking that place of shared language. So a really beautiful example of a ritual community that emerged that a lot of people know about that emerged even before the pandemic is um, the podcast Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. Um, I'm hard pressed to find an emerging adult who doesn't know that podcast. So it took something that was part of the story of their childhood. Harry Potter was this beloved, sacred, sacred text in this expansive way of their childhood years. And so the founders of Harry Potter and the Sacred Text were really interested in religion. Um, they were at a divinity school. They weren't necessarily religious practitioners, but they were wondering about how we take something like that and make and distill meaning from it. And so um, it created a shared language. So when we put Harry Potter on the table, it becomes a text that we are all familiar with. Um, and it substitutes in some ways for for um, those big religious traditions like Christianity, Judaism, Islam, um, it becomes something that we can gather around. Um, and so as we're thinking about this moment in time and um, interconnection between people, people are looking for shared experiences. Um, and so we're seeing that those shared experiences are taking the form of classroom, Absolutely, but they're also taking the form of um, identity communities, um, affinity communities, um, and spaces that had once been important to them. So with the pandemic separating us into our individual homes, our individual residence hall rooms, um, scattering us across the country and for our community across the globe, um, we're searching for ways to um, be in relationship with one another that feels real. We are craving the realness of um, shared activities. So there's three things I want to say about um, ritual um, that makes it different um, or separate from ordinary things in our lives. The one is that ritual includes an intention. It means that we um, are not doing something out of habit, but doing something with a certain level of intentionality. Um, it also requires that we pay attention. We pay attention to the people that we're sharing this ritual with. We pay attention to the words, to the practices, to the music, whatever it is that's part of that shared ritual, and that we repeat it that we do it not just one time, but we do it again and again. So if we think about college life here, um, graduation is a ritual. It's a beloved ritual. It's a ritual we repeat year after year after year. And one of the things that we could say at McAllister that is an important part of that ritual is bagpipes, right? It wouldn't feel like graduation at McAllister without the bagpipes. Um, it is done intentionally. It's placed intentionally in the graduation ceremony. It's something that people pay attention to. Right? It evokes nostalgia, it evokes lots of different feelings, and it's something that we repeat. We repeat not only at graduation, but also at new student welcome, when we gather our community to start the fall semester, um, and at really prominent moments in the life of the college. And in doing so, it forms meaning, but it also fosters a sense of connection. If you met a McAllister graduate from 1964 and a McAllister graduate from 2019, they would hear the bagpipes and say, oh my gosh, that takes me back to this moment. Um, so ritual has a really playful and important bonding kind of effect in our lives. That's great. So obviously none of us knows when this pandemic will end. And we don't yet know what changes in behavior we've experienced we may hold on to when it's over and keep. So I just wonder, what do you hope that people take away from this experience with reconnecting through ritual 
that will remain after we're past the pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. So even the least introspective person um, among us is being very introspective right now, right? We've got ourselves and a lot of time on our hands to think about, um, you know, I've always said I wanted to learn how to play the guitar, but I've had nine months and I haven't learned how to play the guitar. Maybe I don't really want to play the guitar, <laughs> right? So we're being more introspective. We're kind of examining our own lives. We're unmasking who we really are. And so I think after the, the pandemic is over, folks that are playing with ritual in both their personal life and in their shared communal life um, are finding strong benefits. Um, and the correlation is similar to, to meditation, right? Um, folks who meditate, who are doing that practice regularly, are finding that it adds benefits to their life, whether they're doing that from a religious perspective or from a mindfulness perspective or a well-being to address anxiety or depression that they're living with. But we also are seeing that people who are practicing rituals in their life um, so my family ritual of lighting a candle at the table and doing a more intentional check-in at a mealtime um, is transforming my family culture in a way that I really love. Um, and so whether it's, um, you know, being more intentional about how we're shaping our family or our personal lives if we're living alone, um, or shaping shared space with loved ones, um, I think that it's, it's something that there's a lot of benefits. One thing about ritual that makes, um, makes it important is that it makes moments memorable. It sets aside something, we used to use the language of it's making it sacred, mm -hmm. right? Ritual is so steeped in religious language um, that we hold something as sacred. Um, but when we do a ritual action, it sets um, something that is part of our ordinary li lives apart and makes it um, not necessarily extraordinary, but visible. Mm -hmm. So when I um, gather, or any of us could think of examples in our own life, with my two cousins to do a check-in about how being a mom and pandemic life is going, um, and we start by just doing a round of check-ins with each other, um, that is a practice that we are doing. And I suspect that my cousins who live in Connecticut, Illinois, and myself here will keep that practice mm -hmm. of checking in with each other as moms and um, folks who are close mm -hmm. long after the pandemic is over because the ritual work of sharing our lives together um, has created a lot more meaning, fostered a deeper sense of connection, and um, helped us know that we're loved and cared for. Um, so it really has strong um, staying power for our spirits, our well-being, and our thriving. That's wonderful. Reverend Stone, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. We appreciate it. Always a pleasure to talk with you.